All right, I'm not able to uh, pull up my notes with this. I've got a lot of notes wrote on this. Um, but anyhow, we all want a beautiful landscape. Um, and there has been tons of questions uh, about landscapes in the last couple of months with everybody being at home. If you've rode by Lowe's lately, you know everybody is at Lowe's. You can't even get in. There's people waiting outside. Um, and everybody is working in their yards, getting their uh, yards looking good. They're planting new plants. And uh, they're wanting to know what to plant and where to plant, and how to plant them. And, and they just want a good looking yard. Um, but one of the problems that we have with going to big box stores is you're buying plants that um, may not be suitable for our area. Uh, you know, that, that's a big thing that, that you need to, to make sure that we, um, that, that we're aware of is that the plants that we're buying is for our area. Um, so this is a beautiful landscape on the, the screen right here. This is something we all hope to attain. Um, and the way to do it is to uh, purchase uh, plants for our area, plant them the right way, and then look after them the right way. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about um, in this presentation. So hold on just a minute. All right, I'm back. So let's see, trying to get my slide to forward. Maybe I'm gonna have to do it like this. All right. Um, Traditional landscapes, they're boring. We're seeing a whole lot more of them now to where most everybody has just got a lawn and a few shrubs uh, uh, around their house. And if you see these shrubs that are around their house, they're all the same thing. They're either boxwoods or they're some type of holly. Um, and they're all the same. And the thing about a, a monoculture environment is if you look at this picture on the left with this big brick house and this lawn, if you get a disease or insect pressure out here in this lawn, um, it could really wipe out that lawn in just a short amount of time. And then you'd be left with renovating your entire landscape um, and, and not just a little piece here or there. The same way with these shrubs. Uh, in the right hand side of the picture. You see all these shrubs are the same around this right hand side of this picture. Um, a little bit of disease um, coming in, some root rot or insect um, or any type of pest and, and you've got problems with your entire landscape. Um, besides, if you look at these pictures, um, who wants to mow grass all weekend? I mean, for real. Uh, the average American spends three and a half years of your life mowing grass. And the more grass that you have, uh, the more time that you're going to spend. Uh, so nobody wants to spend three and a half years of their life mowing grass. It's easier to have a, a more diverse, uh, natural, uh, low maintenance uh, landscape that you don't have to spend all that much time on that's still going to look good. and um, and help you get yarded a month if that's what you're looking for. So plants are the foundation of all the food webs. Uh, plants through photosynthesis, they capture and convert the sun's energy um, into a form that can be consumed by uh, insects, uh, small mammals and large mammals. Um, if you think about our food chain as humans, um, you know, uh, cows eat grass, uh, pigs eat grain. Everything starts with plants. Uh, that's where things start at is with plants. Um, they are the first level of the food chain and um, having a more diverse uh, planting or diverse plants uh, helps build this uh, wildlife life and it can also help us have a more enjoyable uh, time in our landscape. So 
when you're choosing plants for your landscape, there's a couple of things you need to think about, uh, and they're all important. Uh, local climate. If you just think about Sampson County, there is places near Garland at the Black River that actually on cool nights get, you know, eight to 10 degrees colder than it's going to get in Clinton. Uh, those places um, also can get eight to 10 degrees warmer than it's going to get up toward the northern end of the county around Spivey's Corner. So when I'm talking about local climate, uh, you should be thinking about uh, local. Not only should you be thinking about your local climate, whether it's Turkey, Harold, Spivey's Corner, Garland, you should also be thinking about uh, the conditions in your landscape. Uh, because there are microclimates that are in people's landscapes. And, and those microclimates could be, um, th those microclimates could, could be anything from a depression in the yard where cool air settles. It could be a place that is, uh, has screening plants where no wind actually affects any of the plants or it could be uh, just a moist or wet area in the yard. So think about those uh, growing conditions that's in your yard. One of the biggest things is, is you need to think about what you want. Um, you know, do you want evergreen or deciduous? Uh, do you want plants that have leaves all the time, which is evergreen? Or do you want a deciduous plant uh, which loses its leaves in the fall and goes dormant? Uh, you need to think about uh, color. Do you want, what color patterns do you like? Um, big choices in colors, you know, do you want foliage color or do you want flower color? You also need to think about fragrance. Uh, that's one big thing that I like to choose plants on right now is fragrance. Um, I love to go outside and, and, and smell uh, some flowers that are outside. You know, there's a couple of my favorites we'll talk about later on. And then edibles. A lot of people don't think about planting edible shrubs in their lawn, uh, but there are. And there's a couple of really good choices that you can have to have some edibles in your, in your landscape. And then wildlife, you know, for, or, or do you want wildlife? Do you want to sit around and watch birds? Do you want squirrels in your yard? Um, what kind of wildlife are, are you looking for? Do you want to help feed some of the wildlife? Screening plants, do you need some screen? Do you want privacy? Do you want a windbreak? That's something else. Um, and then what is available? Uh, you know, that's a big thing else. You, you might um, find plants that are, are great for the, your growing condition and plants that you want, but they're not available. So you need some substitutions and think about some substitutions to go in those places. So um, one of the things a lot of people do is, if, you know, from Halloween all the way to the new year is they get those plant catalogs and they start looking at them, and uh, that's when they decide, you know, what kind of plants they want. They see all these new plants that are out, um, and they look great, and they want to buy them and plant them in their yard, but they come to find out they really are hard plants to grow, or they really have to spend a lot of time on them. They're high maintenance, and, and the reason why is because they're not for our hardiness zone. Um, our hardiness zone here in Sampson County, you can see the picture on the right with the stars where we're located in North Carolina, um, is zone 8A. Now, five years ago, uh, we were 7B, 8A, uh, and a little bit of 7A in Sampson County, depending on north to south orientation. But now, um, due to the climate getting warmer, uh, we are, the entire county is in zone 8A. So when you go to select plants from plant catalogs, uh, make sure that it is hardy for U.S. hardiness zone 8A. Um, a great idea is to buy plants from local nurseries because if you're buying a plant from a local nursery, um, they are going to be in our hardiness zone and they're going to work in your landscape depending on uh, soil characteristics and and uh, some other cultural issues that are going on. So when you're also thinking about planting your um, landscape, you need to be thinking about the layers of the landscape. 
Um, there are canopy trees, which are going to reach up into the highest elevations up to 120 feet of a plant layer. Then you're going to have your understory trees, which are trees that's going to be anywhere from 10 to 40 feet high that's going to live around the edges of those canopy trees. Uh, they're called understory trees. Then you're going to have uh, shrubs. Uh, those are anywhere from, from um, uh, three feet high to up to 10 feet high, and they're going to grow in a more multi-trunk uh, or, or small shrub shape. And then uh, those are the three that we're going to talk about today. We're not going to talk about ground covered vines, herbs, or root crops. So when you're thinking about your landscape, you not only need to think about uh, planting it horizontally, and uh, you also need to think about planting it vertically as well to get in some dimension that's moving upwards uh, in the plant layer. So, Cultural practices are a huge thing. You want to put the right plant in the right place. So uh, y'all hear me say this all the time, you got to get the right plant in the right place. Um, and that's exposure. The first thing we're gonna talk about, sun exposure, sun versus shade. Um, full sun is eight direct hours daily or more. Um, so if you get a plant that's in full sun, uh, it needs to be in eight hours uh, of sun daily. Part sun is four direct hours daily. Partial shade is not the same as part sun. A lot of people mix that up. Partial shade is plants that get two to four direct hours daily. And then we need to talk about different types of sun. Morning sun is a lot gentler. Um, shade plants usually do okay with morning sun um because the rays are not as intense um and the heat is not as hot during the day afternoon sun uh, that's hotter harsher sun uh you know plants with full sun and that are drought tolerant heat tolerant really like that afternoon sun um, light shade uh, or dappled shade uh, some people call it dappled shade is um bright shade that's cast by pines um, or, or other type of conifer trees where shade, where some sun gets through, uh, but really not a whole lot. And dark shade could be shade that is cast by buildings um, or hardwoods where no direct sunlight actually gets through. So it's really important when you're planting your plant uh, to know exactly uh, the sun requirements and put it in the place that um, is going to receive that amount of sun. Now, how do you know how your yard, uh, how the sun is going to uh, be coming down in, in your yard? You can map your yard, you can get outside and map it um, every hour, every other hour and just see where the sun is. Um, I watched a video this week where a guy actually took pictures, put a camera on a uh, tripod and set his camera to every hour to take a picture during the daylight hours. And then he transposed them on, on top of each other and found out where all his full sun was and his uh, part sun. And it was really neat, but it was more technical than um, what I can do. But knowing your sun is very important. Knowing your soil is also very important. Whether you have poorly drained or wet soils, um, that's where water stands for days after rainfall. You look at this bottom picture and um, that's where water is just standing after a rainfall. That's going to be poorly drained or wet. Moist soils is where you have moisture most of the time. Um, Water will stand for maybe 24 hours before it drains away after moist soil. Uh, Well-drained soil is water drains away within a few hours after rainfall. Uh, so if you get a good rainfall event, water uh, drains away within, within a few hours, then you've got well-drained soil. And then the last type of soil that we're going to have is xeric soil, which is extremely sandy. Um, and water never stands on it. You know, you, you can have a hurricane and uh, just as soon as the hurricane's over, you can go outside and, and uh, there won't be any water there. If you look at these two pictures up here on, on the top, 
Uh, the picture on the left with the orange boxwoods, um, that is, they're planted in too dry of an area. Uh, if you look at this landscape, they really have a nice looking landscape. Uh, they've got all this rock plant, uh, beside their driveway, but then they've got it going to a drain. So any water that falls in this area is gonna go right to this drain and drain away and none of these boxwoods are gonna have access to it. Then they also have a river birch right here um, that really has a huge expanse root system. Any water that, or rainfall that falls anywhere in this area, that, that tree is really going to suck that water up before uh, those boxwoods are going to have a chance to get to it. The picture on the right, um, when you see, this is also a boxwood, when you see plants that are dying on one side, and then living on another side like this example is, you think about you got a root issue uh, because the roots that are feeding the part that is dead uh, on this plant has got a problem. The roots that are not uh, dead are feeding the other part of the plant. So um, this would be an issue where this boxwood is planted in a too wet area. Uh, it could also be nematodes. Nematodes could be affecting those roots. Uh, but in this example, th this plant is planted in an area that's too wet and it's got root rod and where the roots are dead, you see part of this plant's dead. So those are, that's typically what you're going to see uh, if you plant a plant in too wet a soil is part of the plant's going to be dying, part's going to be living. And then if you plant a plant in too dry of a soil, it's going to burn up like these pictures is on the left. Anybody got any questions so far? If you do, just pop it in the chat box. Or you can, um, or you can uh, just unmute and ask a question. I think I went by a slide right there. So space, that's another thing you got to think of when you're planting a, a plant. Normally when you buy a new plant, it comes in a, a three gallon, a two gallon container and it's gonna be uh, fairly small, but then it's gonna start growing. And you need to make sure you're thinking about the the um, mature uh, dimensions of that plant when you're planting them. Um, if you look at this bottom picture, this is a beautiful azalea that's planted too close to the driveway and they have had to just prune half of that plant off so they could still use their driveway. You know, you move that plant over six more feet and you, you're gonna have a nice specimen plant. Picture on the right, um, you can see these junipers that are planted and they have entirely covered this poor little house. But if you can imagine, when those junipers were planted, they were probably only four or five feet tall and they looked great where they were at planting. But then 10 years down the road, they're gonna look way too big. Don't forget uh, plants growing up and where you're planting them under utilities, uh, phone utilities, telephone cables. Um, this picture on the bottom, the uh, utility workers came by and just whacked the top off and this one, um, they just whacked the whole side off. And I don't know why they would leave this little piece under here like this. Um, but, but think about utilities and where your utilities are and don't plant something that's going to grow up and impede those utilities because then you'll have one that is um, definitely uh, hacked on by the utility company. So we always talk about right plant, right place. Um, but, you know, I don't know if anybody <coughs> ever defines right plant, right place. So to define right plant, right place, you would actually be looking at adapted to your local climate. Um, that would be the right plant in a right place. Adapted to your site conditions, soil, sun, um, uh, those types of things. The right size for the space, you know, are you putting a, a plant where when it's mature, it's going to be in, in the right spot? Uh, is it something you like? You know, you don't want to plant something you don't like and say, I wish I'd have never planted that, um, or it's way too much work than what I wanted to do. Um, so make sure it's something that you like. That's really important. Make sure it's, this is something we're not going to talk about a lot, but that it's not evasive. Um, evasive plant takes over. Um, 
think about bamboo. Um, if if you get bamboo, um, it, it's just terrible to get rid of once you get it. And then make sure that your plant is uh, available. Uh, that's another thing. You got you got to have available uh, plants to uh, be able to plant them in your yard. The way you find out the right plant or the right place is to read the plant tag. Uh, when you get those plants or when you purchase those plants, they're going to have a tag that comes with them. And that tag is going to tell you the sun exposure, what the names are, when it's going to bloom, the water requirements, um, how big it's going to be at maturity, what the spacing needs to be on those plants, the hardiness zone. Is it going to grow in our hardiness zone? Um, how to fertilize it and, and um, other things like that. So make sure when you get those plants that you read the plant tag um, and follow those uh, instructions that are on the plant tag uh, so, so you can um, have a successful planting. So, um, Trees for canopy, and these trees are going to take a uh, pretty long time to grow. You know, you're looking at uh, 10 to 20 years uh, looking at, at canopy trees to grow. But when you plant a canopy tree, uh, the best place to plant those canopy trees is going to be on the west side of the home. And that way it shades your house from the hot afternoon sun and gives you max energy savings. Uh, so if you've got trees and you want to, to, to plant some shade uh, on your property, uh, make sure that you're orienting those trees to the west side to block that afternoon sun off your home. And your house will be cooler and you won't have as much as energy expense open, uh, energy expense to pay. Uh, I used to have a huge oak tree on the west side of my house. Um, it was actually growing over 421 Highway. The DOT came out, that tree was over 150 years old. The DOT came out and they cut it down and my energy bill went up about $25 a month uh, because that tree uh, was cut down and then the afternoon sun was, um, was just shining down. Uh, on my house and it just costed us a whole lot more money um, because we're getting that afternoon sun. So some shade trees that is great for our area. Um, Willow Oak Quercus Fellows is the actual Latin name for it. They grow 50 to 100 feet high. Uh, they're 40 to 50 feet wide. Uh, they are a deciduous tree, which means they're going to lose their um, leaves in the fall and they're going to go dormant. Uh, if you look down at the left, bottom left hand side, this is what the leaves are going to look like um, on those, on, on those uh, trees. Uh, you're going to get a nice green color in the summertime. Uh, the spring, those leaves are going to come on. It's going to have a nice uh, green coloration to it. And then in the fall, you're going to get this nice orange color. So there's going to be some color differentiation um, on these trees. So look at my notes and see if I've got anything else. They're great for wildlife. Uh, they do have acorns and um, they do well in uh, dry to wet soils. So they can take drier wet soils. If you have those type of soils, this would be a good tree for it. Then we have pin oaks. Uh, pin oaks have a larger leaf on them. Uh, they are deciduous. They grow up to 100 feet tall. Uh, the medium maintenance, there's not a whole lot of maintenance to do on them. And um, they have this beautiful red hue. Those leaves turn in the fall, real different color contrast on them. And they are also a good plant for, for wildlife and for 
attracting wildlife. Quercus alba um, is your white oak. Uh, it's going to have the same as the other oaks. It's going to be good for wildlife. It's going to have acorns. It is deciduous. And it's also going to turn a, a orangey color in, in the fall to give you some color contrast on, on those uh, leaves uh, to give you some contrast in your yard. The issue with uh, Quercus alba or white oaks is they have catkins uh, for flowers similar to a pecan tree and they are messy when they fall. Um, you know, there's some more maintenance with those trees than uh, other oaks. Asa rubrum is uh, one of my favorite trees. Uh, really great uh, structure and habit on this tree. Real low maintenance, they grow quickly. Um, you know, 15 years, you can be up to mature size. Um, and then in the fall, they just get this spectacular red foliage on them really stands out in the landscape. You can see in this picture on the right side. In the springtime, when they uh, break dormancy, they're going to flower uh, with red flowers. Um, really uh, are a beautiful uh, tree to have in your landscape, uh, to have that, that bright red color in the fall when, when you don't really have a whole lot of other colors. Uh, river birch is um, our next tree. This tree can is really, uh, even though it's called uh, river birch, Betula nigra is the name to it, uh, is, is the Latin name to it. It is, um, let me go back, I'm just trying to add somebody. It has exfoliating bark on it. The barks can be many different colors from grays to reds to cinnamon colors. Um, it it's really gives texture to a landscape. Uh, they grow quickly. Uh, it doesn't take but about 10 to 15 years to grow to mature heights. They are low maintenance trees. Um, they are adaptable, even though they're called the river birds, they're adaptable to many different types of soils. So, um, wet soils, dry soils, well-drained soils, river birch does well uh, <laughs> to all of those uh, places. So really good tree uh, for a, a, a landscape. And I can't change slides with that button. Um, Magnolia grandiflora is your southern magnolia. Uh, can grow up to 80 feet high, about 30 feet wide. They're a really upright tree. They're evergreen. They hold their leaves all year. Um, a call, I've had a lot of calls right now about there's something wrong with my magnolia because it's dropping in a lot of leaves, but, but it's time for magnolia to shed a lot of leaves this time of year. So um, mid-spring, magnolia start dropping leaves. Um, they are a great fragrant tree. Um, I love going outside and smelling my magnolias when they're in bloom. They have the, once they bloom, they have this uh, fruit on them that has these tiny little berries. Birds love them. Uh, they come out and they eat them. And I actually went out in my yard this morning and I have a magnolia bloom that was open on my tree. I'm going to smell it. I'm going to hold it up to the camera so y'all can smell it. It's going to go through there, I'm sure. I know, smells so good, uh, that magnolia leaf. And you can see how big it is. Um, really a big, big bloom, about a foot wide. Um, and just smells spectacular. Um, I'm ready for a whole lot of, more of them to bust out. So when I walk out my, my uh, in my landscape, uh, I can smell them. Uh, they are messy because they, shed a lot of leaves um, and they drop these fruit pods on the ground at the end of the year, but, but really an outstanding uh, uh, tree for the landscape. Now I'm gonna try to do something here. Uh, Mark Weatherton talks about a different type of uh, magnolia and this is a magnolia serendipity 
Oh, uh, so I'm gonna see if I can get this to play. The J.C. Ross Arboretum holds a couple of national collections of red buds, and we're part of a multi-institution group of 16 botanic gardens and arboreta around the country that hold a collective magnolia. <coughs> Brad, we don't have sound. Brad, we can't, we're not getting any vo voice. All right. I hear y'all say we ain't got no sound. I worked on this for two hours yesterday getting sound. Uh, can everybody hear my voice? If you can hear my voice, you should be able to hear the sound. Um, yeah, we can hear you. We hear your voice, but no sound. But nobody hears the sound on the video. No. No. Yeah. Well, darn. Well, Brad, we heard a few sentences at the very beginning, but then it stopped. Yeah. Okay. Well, I did this. I did a practice run yesterday and we heard it all. I'll go ahead and I'll just um, summarize what Mark's saying in this video. Um, this is Serendipity Magnolia. Uh, it's a new magnolia. It's not upright shape. It's more round shape, kind of. If you think about a Bradford pear, uh, that's kind of the shape that this magnolia is. Um, it starts flowering earlier in the spring. It flowers for over a month long. Um, so it's really fragrant. It's as fragrant as the Southern magnolia and it can actually flower all the way into late summer. So. So you may, may get up to two months of, of flowering on, on this uh, serendipity magnolia. Um, it's a new plant. Uh, JC Arboretum has a, a collection of magnolias. So if you're thinking about a magnolia, uh, this may be uh, one to go in your landscape. It's not going to be as tall, but it's going to be round shape. It may be 40 by 40. Um, so basically in summary that's what uh, mark is saying about this plan i've got some more videos embedding um and we'll either try uh the videos like this or i may try to pull them up on youtube and just show them on youtube in just a minute so sorry about that so the next plant we're looking at is the uh sweet bay magnolia um it is also evergreen. It's another uh, uh, magnolia. It's magnolia virginiana. Um, it has a smaller flower. It is just as fragrant as um, the southern magnolia. 
Um, it's not going to get as wide, but it's going can get a lot taller than the southern magnolia. Again, it is a messy tree as well. Um, then there is um, one of my favorites uh, is the Pinus palustris, which is the longleaf pine. There used to be native stands of longleafs in Sampson County. It was a staple of the naval industry back in the 1800s. Uh, due to it being so popular, there's no more left because they were either tapped in for turpentine or used for the naval stores. And they're gone. There's a lot of people now that is restoring some of these longleaf pine natural stands. Um, but it is a evergreen needle. It has a needle that is um, up to two feet long. Um, it's very low maintenance. Uh, you see the growth rate, it says rapid. However, um, that longleaf pine is going to spend the first year, of it, first four years of its life in the grass stage. Um, and when I say in the grass stage, it's going to look like it's not even growing any. Um, then after four years, it grows that long tap root, and then it starts growing up, and then it's fairly quickly um, will grow up. One of the great things about having longleaf pines is you can rake your own pine straw and have it for mulch um, in your landscape. So understory trees, and we talked about understory trees earlier. These are trees that's, that's going... Um, uh, the picture on the right, you can see the canopy trees, uh, the pines behind this dogwood. Uh, they're not going to be near as tall, um, and they're going to be able to take some shade. Um, so this is Cornus, Florida. This is our flowering dogwood tree that everybody loves um, in the coastal plains of North Carolina. Um, it can grow up to 25 feet tall. It can be just as wide as it is tall. It is deciduous. It's going to lose its leaves in the fall. It is a slow grower. Um, you know, it, where these pine trees in 25 years, um, in this picture on the right, uh, will be mature. Uh, this dogwood may only be, you know, half mature in the same amount of time. It is low maintenance. Um, and I say low maintenance, it depends on what kind of problems you have with it. You can see in the picture on the bottom, um, in the fall, you have these red, yellowish leaves. Those leaves turn red to yellowish before it falls. And then you have these red berries that really attracts a whole lot of songbirds um, to your landscape. So, so this is a good plant for that. Now, on the flip side of dogwoods, dogwoods in our area have a lot of trouble. Um, one of the big things is people plant them where it is too wet. Um, dogwoods really can't take wet feet. Uh, so it really needs to be in well drained to a, a little bit of dry soil uh, to plant those dogwoods. Other problems that you have with dogwoods is um, dogwood bores. Uh, they like to attack the dogwood tree and bore holes in into the trees, uh, which can eventually kill it. And then we have spot anthracnose and dogwood anthracnose, which is disease that attacks dogwoods. So uh, great tree everybody likes. However, it does have problems. And um, typically um, in our area, they are not going to live uh, very long, uh, 20, 25 years, um, especially if they're planted in the wrong place. It's going to shorten uh, their lifespan. So when you're planting a dogwood, make sure if you're going to plant one that you are in the right place for that dogwood. Here's another video. Um, this is talking about the Sawani squat, uh, Cornus floridia. This is flowering dogwood. Um, they have these at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. I'm going to try real fast to see if I can pull up the YouTube video and play it instead. So this might take me just a second. So let me pull it up. All right, all right, all right. 
plants them too. Ah, right, here we go. In North Did anybody hear that start? Yes. All right, maybe we can work. Now let me share my screen. In North Carolina, we love our flowering dogwoods, our, our native dogwood. And some people think they can get a little too big for their landscapes, or maybe you just need a nice deciduous shrub. And an option you might want to think about is this dogwood called Suwannee Squat, Hornets, Florida Suwannee Squat. So this is our native dogwood, but it's a genetic dwarf. It'll grow slowly as a mounded shrub. It gets beautiful white flowers, very typical of any other flowering dogwood that, that we grow, our native flowering dogwood. This one, as the flowers completely expand, it's just starting to get there, will become pure white and have nice overlapping petals, so very kind of dense looking flowers on there, or good substance flowers. Now, I'm calling these flowers. We know these are actually modified leaves of bracts that are there, and the flowers are here in the center of the, the flower, but at the center of the inflorescence. But y'all knew what I meant. We've got it growing out in a good bit of sun, but it will grow in more shade. It is not mildew resistant. It will get powdery mildew, so if it's in more sun with better air circulation, we'll have a reduced amount of powdery mildew. Once it leaves out, it's a nice green plant for the summer. Just great fall color like other dogwoods. It will often form fruit, little bright red fruit that the birds will love to come through and pick it clean for you. It's a really good plant. Don't make sure you don't plant it where it's too wet and otherwise you shouldn't have any problems with it. It can be had uh, sometimes from specialty nurseries. We often propagate it and have it for sale at our spring plant sales and on our plant cart here at the Arboretum. So you can always look for it here as well. So that is the Sawani Squat. Um, if you are interested in that. The J.C. Ross oh. Arboretum holds a couple of national collections. We hold red buds and we're part of a multi-institution group of 16 botanic gardens. Well, maybe I'll get this stopped. Country that hold a collective magnolia collection. There we go. Now let's see if I can get back to my PowerPoint. Good. So that's the Sawani Squat. If y'all saw it in, in the video, I know the video wasn't syncing up uh, what he was saying with um, his motions. Uh, evidently, our internet ain't good enough to get that. But um, the height and width of that uh dogwood was almost mature so if you want a smaller dogwood in your yard uh, you saw the relative size of that uh where mark was standing uh that is really a great new dogwood uh, coming out still has the same problems um but as uh regular uh cornus floridia but um it's just a, a shorter, more compact, uh, has more uh, flowers on it than the um, original Cornus Florida. So then another dogwood is the Cornus Coosa. Uh, that's the Coosa dogwood you can see in the top left picture. Uh, the flowers are a little different. Um, they don't form the cross. They don't have the pink on the outside. Uh, but you can see uh, beautiful flowers uh, when it's flowering over here on the right. There also is some pink variations of this. Um, it's going to be about the same size as the Cornus Florida. Um, it's also deciduous. It's going to have some of the same problems that um, the Cornus Floridia or flowering dogwood has. Uh, root rots, powdery mildew, dogwood borer, um, leaf spots. However, it is more resistant to anthracnose, uh, dogwood anthracnose than the flowering dogwood. So if you really like dogwoods and you have a problem with 
uh, dogwood anthracnose uh, cornus cusa uh, is the way to go. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, Circus candesis. That is the Eastern red bud. Uh, they grow to 20 to 30 feet high. They are uh, a little bit wider than they are tall. They have this really um, arching growth habit. Uh, the first thing to um, bloom in the spring, you see this picture on the left where my cursor is, uh, is this really purple flowers um, in the springtime. And it really comes on about the same time the forsythia is blooming. Um, typically, it's gonna be some type of upright arch tree and now there is a whole lot more um, different cultivars. This is rising sun down here at the bottom where it has uh, some yellow and orange leaves. This is the summertime leaf uh, foliage color on them. Really um, is a great tree for, for our area for an understory tree. Um, Vitex agnus castus, this is Shoal Creek. This is a Vitex. Um, it actually looks like a butterfly bush. Uh, you see the picture on the right, really brilliant flowers, um, pinnacle erect flowers sticking up from the, from the foliage. Um, it is a rapid grower. It's really low maintenance tree. Um, needs good drainage to occasionally dry. It attracts a lot of butterfly and, and songbirds. Um, if you get in too wet of soils, you can wind up with some uh, root rot. So you really want that good drainage uh, to dry. This is a drought tolerant tree. You won't have to be hauling water to it all summer long if we get in a drought. Um, and now they also have different color variations of the flowers. So down here in the bottom is the uh, white coloration of, of the Shoal Creek. So really a spectacular specimen tree if you want one in your landscape that is an understory tree um can't have talk about understory trees unless you talk about acer palmatum or japanese maples they come in many different varieties and cultivars they come in all different types of variegation you can see down here on the bottom um they come in brilliant colors all year long, bright reds, dark greens, orange, burgundy, to yellows, uh, really good specimen trees uh, to have uh, in your landscape. Very low maintenance. This is Amalanca arborea, which is the service berry. It's not quite as big as the dogwoods. Uh, in the springtime, they have, they really open up and flower before the the leaves come on. You can see the white flowers in the picture on the right. In the summertime, they have really nice uh, green foliage. Then in the winter, they get this brilliant bright orange. Um, you can see in this picture on the left, really adds a shot of color to your landscape in the fall uh, before the leaves drop. It is a deciduous tree. It actually produces some berries. Birds really love this tree. Uh, they come eat the berries off of it. They'll visit you as long as there is berries on the tree. Very low maintenance, um, low maintenance tree with no issues. Uh, so if you're looking low maintenance, something that attracts some birds with some fall color, uh, Amalanker is a really good choice to have. Also, you couldn't do without crepe myrtles, Lagostromi indica, come in all shapes and sizes. We've talked about crepe myrtles a lot before. Um, problem with crepe myrtles is uh, they do have issues, uh, crepe myrtle scale, other types of scale that's on crepe myrtles. Uh, pruning, you really need to get out and prune these crepe myrtles so you get airflow to, to keep powdery mildew down off of them. Um, and uh, beautiful panicle flowers, but you just have uh, the way your options, good versus bad problems uh, versus uh, what you're gonna get out of it. Really high maintenance trees cause you got to be out there pruning every year and you got to stay on top of the powdery mildew in the scale. Shrubs, 
Uh, now we're going to get to the shrub layer of the, of the plant layers. So th this is Calicarpa Americana, American Beautyberry. Um, this has an upright and arching growth habit. Uh, they really put on these berries uh, in the summertime. Um, there is different cultivars uh, of these shrubs. Alba is one. Alba, you know, is going to be your white berries down here on the bottom. Most of them has a, a pink to a lavender or purple berry that runs down the stems. Um, really a, a good shrub to have. They attract a lot of, of birds that, that come in and, and um, eat these berries uh, in summer and uh, late summer and uh, no issues on this shrub. Um, get it in full, uh, full sun to full shade. Um, it can take full shade or full sun. It, it's really acclimated to either one. Um, and it can take soils that are occasionally wet. So if you got a wet area in your yard, it's not full sun, maybe it's part sun, maybe it's got a lot of shade. Um, uh, American Beautyberry would be a good plant for that choice. Uh, the only thing I would say is um, the more shade you get, the less fruiting that you're going to have on it. The more sun you get, the more fruiting you're going to have on it. If you see these top two pictures, uh, the, the plant on the right is in full sun and you can see all the, the berries that are loaded on this plant. The one on the left is in more shade. This is earlier in the year. Um, it's going to have berries on it later on in the year, but not quite as much as you are if you get in full sun. So really a, a great plant to have um, in your landscape is this beauty berry. Uh, some people also pick the berries and make jams and marmalades out of them. I never have, but, but um, there are people that, that make jams and marmalades out of it. Viburnum nudum. Um, this is the possum hall viburnum. It can grow up to 12 feet high. Most of the time in our area, it's not going to. Um, it is also a deciduous shrub. Uh, in the summertime, you're going to get white flowers on it with beautiful green foliage. Um, in the wintertime, uh, you're going to get some, some uh, reds and yellows. Um, and then the berries that are, that, um, are the fruit of this plant is going to turn uh, blue. Uh, so really a good juxtapose of colors in, in your landscape. Um, this is brandywine, the species brandywine on the left. It's really going to get a whole lot um, redder in the fall uh, than the one on the right, which is winter thur. So there is different varieties of each one of these. Um, no issues on viburnums. Um, so really low maintenance. Uh, so if you want low maintenance plants uh, in your landscape, these are some of them. Lindera benzoin, this is the spice bush. Um, it is, can be 15 by 15, it is a deciduous plant. Um, it has a rounded uh, habit, it's gonna be more rounded shrub. Um, growth rate is not, not as fast as some, but it's really not slow. In the springtime, you're gonna get these uh, yellow um, flowers that come out on it. Uh, and those yellow flowers, once they're pollinated, they're gonna turn into these red berries down here on the right. Really another low maintenance plant with no issues. Um, in the fall, you're gonna get this great yellow color, another pop of color to add to your landscape. There is a cultivar um, called Rubra that these will have yellow and red flowers. So if you wanted something a little different, you could actually get that cultivar and uh, have that in your yard. Father Gillia uh, Gardenia. Um, this is Dwarf Father Gillia. Um, not such a big plant. You can see in the summertime, um, when it actually, or early, late spring to, to summer, um, it's gonna bloom and it's gonna have these bottle brush blooms on it that are erect and standing upright. Really uh, interesting specimen. Then in the fall, these uh, leaves are gonna just 
turn yellow, orange, almost sun color, uh, really bring a lot of color uh, into your landscape. Um, very low maintenance, uh, no issues. Bees and songbirds really love these uh, flowers, so you're going to get good pollinators in it. And it is also a very fragrant uh, um, shrub. Uh, a lot of people say it smells like honey. Uh, if you can think about that, uh, the smell of honey, that's, that's what these flowers uh, smell like. So uh, again, another really low maintenance plant that we can, that you can plant in your landscape um, that has very little issues. It, it can also take full sun to dappled shade and it can take good drainage to occasionally wet soils. Clethora alnifolia, sweet pepper bush. This is another bottle brush type uh, flowering plant. Um, it grows rounding, uh, erect. It is a very dense plant. Um, it has low maintenance as well. It is good for um, a wildlife. They're attracted to the flowers. All your pollinators are coming in. Um, it can go full sun to partial shade. It likes moist soils. Um, however, Clethora alnifolia does have a few issues. Uh, spider mites is, is an issue. Uh, spider mites really like uh, Clethora. Uh, Clethora also can't stand hot, humid, uh, dry sites, a uh, real hot summertime. So um, really think about if you're going to plant this in your landscape, um, keep it away from afternoon sun, and you'll have to keep it looked at. Uh, for spider mites that's on it. Uh, really sp another spectacular plant uh, for your landscape. One of my all-time favorites is Edgeworthy uh, Chrysantha, which is your paper bush. Uh, you can see this picture right here uh, on the left where my cursor is. This is uh, flowering in uh, late winter. Um, you, it's a deciduous, you can see there are no leaves on it. The flowers come out and really pop. And these are just clusters of flowers. You can see on the bottom, clusters of flowers. My neighbor actually has two of these um, on my walking trail when I walk in the morning. And uh, when they're in bloom, I can smell them, you know, a couple of hundred yards away from them uh, before I even get anywhere close to them. Um, so they are really fragrant, um, smell better than a magnolia to me, um, and uh, just put a, put a lot of odor out when they are um, in bloom. You can see the picture on the right is what it's going to look like um, in the summertime once it put the leaves on. This is very low maintenance. Um, some of the cultivars, the Crystallina is probably one of the most fragrant. Hummingbird is another one. Um, they are just terrific um, plants to go in the landscape. Uh, that is also low maintenance. And I told you wrong on those, let me back up. I told you wrong on those varieties if you're writing them down. The cultivars for this is Red Dragon, Gold Rush, and Snow Cream. Those are the varieties for these. Um, and they can go um, sun, there are sun requirements. They do need some shade, so don't plant them in any afternoon sun. And um, they'll be a great plant for you. Spirea Neponica, this is actually snow mound. Spirea. Um, they're going to grow up to five feet high, five feet wide. They are really an arching plant. Um, beautiful when covered with flowers. They also have small clusters of flowers on them. Um, they enjoy full sun. They like well-drained soils. They are drought tolerant. Um, so you can see uh, this person has them in a rock landscape. Um, so they can take some dry, if you have an area that's dry that you're not going to get out the water a lot, this can really bring a lot of color there to you. Um, however, uh, talk about some issues that Spirea has, 
Um, they are actually in the apple family. Uh, it's hard to believe apple and uh, they can actually get fire blight. So you need to make sure that you don't have uh, fire blight on them. Um, powdery mildew is something else that you can find on these. And because they like dry sites, if you get them in the wrong spot uh, and the soil's too wet, they can have root rot. So those are a few of the issues, not a lot of issues, um, but those are some of the things if you're really looking for this spirea snow mound, uh, things you need to look for. So here is another, I'm gonna have to stop share and go back to my video and see if I can pull up the, uh, my other video. from J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Here in North Carolina, we love- Not that one. So this is a different spirea. And this is um, double play candy corn is what this one is. And- um, NC State, you See if I can get this to share. The right screen. There we go. Make it full size. NC State University and the JC Ross and Arboretum are always known for the new plants that they bring to the public's attention. One of the hottest new plants that's being introduced by NC State is Dr. Tom Randy's Double Play Candy Corn Spirea. Now this spirea comes out screaming orange in the spring before darkening, have more burgundy, and then going to yellow as the foliage ages. You can get where the name candy corn comes from because it has all those colors with less high fructose corn syrup in it. <laughs> Now, one of the great things with Tom Randy spireas is he's worked to reduce the fertility in them so that they produce almost no seed, keep flowering for a long period of time. Now, this one has been just a color show since the first leaves came out. It's been pretty frost tolerant even with those first leaves when we dipped into the cold. We've only been growing it for a couple of years, but we already find this to be one of our most asked about plants in the Arboretum. And it's a great pollinator plant as well. So that was a nice uh, little discussion about the uh, candy corn spirea. Um, pull my PowerPoint back up from Mark Weatherton, who, if you don't know who he is, is the director at J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Um, another really spectacular plant is the hydrangea paniculata. This is limelight. Uh, it can grow eight feet high by eight feet wide. Typically, it probably won't get that here in our growing area, probably more like six to eight. It is a deciduous plant. It'll lose its leaves in the fall. It is um, uh, erect growth habit. It grows very rapid. It is low maintenance. Um, it also has the same problems that many of your other hydrangeas have with leaf spots. So that's really the only issue uh, that you're gonna have. Um, it can grow full sun to part shade and it needs well drained soil. Um, so really, if you want a, a um, great plant that's gonna bloom later in the summer um, and have these beautiful um, white to chartreuse colored blooms on them, uh, to get some, some late summer blooms in your yard and color, this is really um, a spectacular, another spectacular plant. This is Budlia Grand Cascade uh, Butterfly Bush. If um, any of you know Tony Avent um, up at Plant Delights, this is right now his favorite plant. Um, 
Uh, this is one of his workers out there at Plant Delight showing what it looks like. This has uh, 14 to 80, 18 inch flower spikes on it. Um, it is really a butterfly magnet. Uh, this is the mature height on the right that it's going to get. So it's going to get about four to six feet high. It's going to get about six to eight feet wide. It's also deciduous like other uh, budlias. Um, it's really a rapid grower. It has uh, low maintenance. Um, so you really don't have a, a lot of maintenance that you have to do with this plant as long as you get it in the right place. It needs full sun, uh, good drainage, and um, those blooms are going to come on late spring in the summer. And um, really a butterfly magnet. Thousands of butterflies will be attracted to this uh, plant. So if you, if you want something butterfly-wise, um, this Grand Cascade uh, cultivar of Budlia is, um, like I said, Tony Avent's favorite. I decided to put it on my list because it's just, um, just, just uh, something really different uh, to look at in, in a landscape. Um, going into edibles, shrubs. Um, a lot of people don't talk about edibles with shrubs, but I, you know, shrubs need. Uh, some type of versatility. They either need to smell good or attract wildlife or, or have something edible on them um, to be really relevant in my opinion. And it can be whatever you want your opinion to be, but um, we'll go into uh, Vicinium virgatum, that's rabbit eye blueberry. There is also high bush blueberry. Uh, they grow, can grow up to 15 feet tall, uh, eight feet wide depending on what variety you get, if you get powder blues, um, they can actually start growing out from root shoots and can take over a, an area. So, so a few, a little bit of work to do with them. Uh, you see maintenance is medium. Uh, they need pruning every year if you want to um, have good fruit on them and uh, to keep them in their space. Um, there's another phone call. That makes four since we've been on this. So anyhow, uh, they are deciduous. They're going to lose their leaves in the uh, fall. Uh, but really, the fruit that you get out of them, uh, May through uh, July, depending on what variety you plant, um, is really worth having these in your landscape. And then in the fall, before the leaves drop, you get this spectacular red color again. Um, issues. Uh, with blueberries is uh, just a little bit of maintenance you got to do on them. And if you're actually looking for them to produce fruit, uh, you know, late freezes. Um, and then there's some disease uh, and leaf spots that, leaf spots that you can get that will um, cause you some problems. But other than that, very little issues. Um, they like well-drained soils, um, really, and they like acidic soils. So it needs to be more acidic and more well-drained uh, than anything else that you got. Some good cultivars. I already mentioned powder blue is a, a late fruit and cultivar. Columbus is like a mid-season. That would be the one I would recommend more around here. Then if you want a high bush, not a rabbit eye, a uh, new Hanover is... Um, a great one uh, for our area. Next plant, fig. I've got several fig trees here in my landscape. Um, really produce a great caramel tasting fruit. Uh, birds love them. Uh, wasps love them. Uh, squirrels come get them. June beetles. So I really have to get out there and and keep the fruit picked off of them when it ripens or, or I have a lot of problems. They are deciduous shrub. They're going to grow 10, can grow 10 by 10. I actually have a Celeste that's a whole lot bigger than 10 by 10. So um, in the right place, they can actually grow bigger than uh, what, what they are. are. Cultivars for our area, Celeste and brown turkey. 
Um, they need good drainage. They fruit in the summertime, June, July, August, depending on what variety you have. And um, great for making preserves and jellies and jams and just eating uh, fresh right off the tree. Uh, Daphne Odora, fragrant Daphne. Uh, as most of y'all know, that's one of my favorites. A great fragrant, um, really fragrant uh, plant. Great smells coming out of it. They're not going to get too big. This is an evergreen uh, shrub, so you're going to have leaves on it year round. It is more mounding. There is uh, very little issues with with Daphne. Um, um, in the spring and winter, you're going to have these uh, small little blooms on it. Really a nice looking uh, shrub. And most of them is going to have the variegated leaves on them. So really add a, adds a lot of color and texture to your landscape. I'm going to skip for time. Uh, Mark's going to talk about a Daphne Pseudo, I can't even say that name, Pseudo Mesorum. Uh, another Daphne that they're working with that JC Arboretum, you can actually go to YouTube and type in JC Arboretum and they have a lot of videos on YouTube that you can look at some of these plants. Gardenia jasminoids, that's uh, just an old timey gardenia. It can grow eight to eight. It is another evergreen mountain shrub. Um, it has rather high maintenance and the reason why is because it can have some issues. Um, if it's in a place that it don't like, you can have a whole lot of issues with a gardenia. Um, so, it can needs to be partial uh, part sun to partial shade. Um, the more sun it gets, uh, the more blooms it'll have, but full sun can actually burn it. Um, it needs good drainage, too wet of soils will cause you to have uh, root rots. So that's something you need to look at. And it is another very fragrant uh, shrub. If you like something that smells good um, in the summertime, uh, gardenia jasminoids, it really will, will pump out some good smells uh, around your house. Um, some of the better cultivars is Crown Jewel. Um, it has a much larger flower and it's a more cold hardy gardenia. And then Frost Proof is one that um, is a staple around in our area. Laura Petum Chinese, which is Chinese fringe flowers. We have these around the office. Um, they can grow five by five. Um, they can grow five by five. They are evergreen plant. You get different colors from green to ruby to dark plum. And in the springtime, they get these flowers on them. Uh, you can see down here in the bottom, these are white flowers. Some have red and pink flowers on them. And um, just a really attractive flower with no issues. Uh, very low maintenance. Uh, the maintenance you need to do to these is um, make sure you're pruning them to the shape you want uh, because uh, they can grow a little bigger than five by five if they're in the right place. and um, you just make sure they don't want to get too big. Some of the great cultivars for our area is Crimson Fire, Rubrum, or some of the red ones. Snow Dance is the white one. They need good drainage. Um, like I said, they bloom in the spring and they have no issues. Um, you almost plant them and leave them. Uh, Sue has asked a question. Can you buy plants from the Arboretum? The answer is yes. Uh, the Arboretum, um, always has a little card out front at the visitor's entrance with plants on them. Um, you can also email uh, Mark or Tim Alderman, uh, who's led a lot of our tours at Arboretum, and they will let you know what they have, uh, what they're gonna have for sale and when their sales are. You can always check their website for um, what they have for sale. Uh, this is a shrub that um, doesn't get talked about as much as others. This is a uh, Linnae uh, cross grandiflora, which is glossy abelia. 
Uh, they can get from three to 10 feet, depending on if they like where they're at. Uh, they can get four to eight feet wide. They are evergreen. They are a really dense shrub that has neat little flowers on them. Uh, they are low maintenance. Typically, where you see these plants at is gonna be like this top picture in a shopping mall. Uh, they're gonna be lining these islands in a shopping mall, or they're gonna be uh, on the interstate access ramps. You will see these all around the interstate access ramps. And the reason why they're used in these locations is because you put them in the ground and you leave them alone. And there's very little maintenance to them. Um, uh, it, they like full sun. Uh, they can also take part sun or partial shade. They like good drainage. If you put them in a space like that, you never have to worry about these plants anymore, except maybe pruning uh, in the, in the uh, late winter. Uh, this is kaleidoscope here on the right. You see these pink flowers, variegated leaves, really adds a lot of color. And all these shrubs um, are going to give you a different choice than the boxwoods and the, and the hollies that people typically, and the yopons that people typically plant in their landscape that look like little green meatballs uh, that really don't give you anything but problems. Um, so these are good alternatives uh, to any of those plants. And Glossia bee, um, you may like it, you may not like it, but it is a great alternative um, to, to some of those little green meatballs that are out there. Distillium. Uh, this is actually a new Georgia release. Um, it is finally out on the market. It's been out on the market for maybe a year now. Um, they grow six to eight feet wide and high. Uh, it's an evergreen, it's erect and arching. You can see at the bottom how those stems arch out. Um, well, this picture on the right is what they would look like. Uh, at a foundation landscape. Uh, they grow rapid. Uh, they have very low maintenance. Um, they have these small maroon flowers um, in the summertime. They're not gonna be very showy, uh, but they are there if you look at them. They like full to partial sun. Uh, and they like good drainage and they can take a little bit of wet, moist or wet soils. Um, so if you got an area that's a little wetter than others, the stelium might be a good place for them. There are no problems so far reported with this plant. So no insect, no pest. Um, the only thing you got to do is trim them back in late winter and um, then they will be a, a great looking plant for you in your landscape. Uh, native grass, Muhlenberg capillarius is uh, muley grass. This is red muley grass. Really grows great in the landscape. It doesn't get big, maybe three feet high by three feet wide. Very little water requirements um, and very low maintenance. A lot of people, if you see this top picture, like to put them in front of rose bushes because those rose bushes will grow up in the back. Um, and give you a really great looking landscape with this red tip grass uh, that is native. Um, so no issues in our area. Um, all you got to do is plant it and almost forget it and uh, you'll have uh, a great plant. A, a lot of people don't like pompous grass. However, I do, I put this on the list. It can be a great specimen plant. Um, especially when it blooms um, in the summertime and late summer. A lot of people take these blooms and use them in uh, floral arrangements, in cuttings. They use them as cut flowers. Um, the only thing issue about pompous grass is you really need to go down there and cut it back in the wintertime. It has real sharp blades um, and you got to wear gloves and long sleeve shirts to cut it back. You cut it back about a foot of the ground and then it'll come back uh, in the springtime. But really, you can see it in this landscape, how this person has really used it as a specimen plant. It looks really good. So to take home, um, 
you need to have a more diverse landscape than just lawn and little green meatballs. Um, that way, uh, if you have issues with any type of pest, disease, insect, um, weather related, it's not going to take out your entire landscape. Select plants that you like uh, for your growing conditions. Um, that's the great thing about um, your landscape is it's yours. Uh, make sure you're looking at U.S. Hardiness Zone 8A. Put the right plant in the right place for sun, soil, and, um, and then uh, growing conditions. Give it space and you should have a great landscape uh, in, in your home landscape or if you're giving people advice on landscapes. So these are some of the newer plants, some of the old ones that that can be really uh, good in landscape. And um, that's it. So if anybody's got any questions, you can type them in the chat box or you can, um, you can uh, unmute and ask questions about it. Brad, I have a question that's not with the, um, with the plants that you just showed. But a neighbor of mine said that he had used neem oil on an area in his yard. That